uh, thanks for coming. Uh, my name's Tony Davis, and I'm the owner of the Million Year Picnic, which is a comic book store in Harvard Square in Cambridge. Uh, we've been there about 42 years, which makes us the oldest comic book store uh, in New England, and I think the second oldest existing store in the United States. So, and we're here to... <laughs> So basically, I wandered into the store as a customer and was a good customer for a long time. And one day, they offered me a job. And the first day that I started working, the person who hired me warned me. He said, uh, when you enter this place, it's a trap. It's very easy to come in, very hard to get out. And that was a little over 30 years ago. I've owned the shop for the last 20 years. And it's been great to see a lot of wonderful comics and comic creators come through our doors. Um, so I'm honored today to be on a panel with two very talented people. I'm actually going to read the biography here because it's better than the one I wrote. Whit Taylor is a cartoonist, editor, and writer from New Jersey. She's received a Glyph Award and two nominations for her autobiographical comics, Watermelon and Boxes, as well as an Ignatz Award yeah, for her miniseries, Madtown High. Uh, some of her latest works include The Anthropologist from Sparkplug Books, which was selected as a notable comic for Best American Comics in 2015, Ghost, self which she self-published, and then she edited a fantastic anthology called Subcultures that was published by Ninth Art Press. Um, there are copies of that book in the back. It's a great book with a lot of wonderful people in it and very interesting subject matter, so I, I recommend picking it up. Um, so, Whit Taylor. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so, Barrington Edwards, by the, the bio on, uh, online for him, I think described himself as someone who came kicking and screaming into the world in uh, 1970. And uh, by the looks of all that he's done, he has been kicking and screaming ever since. Um, he's an artist, an educator, uh, a publisher. Um, he's worked as a freelance artist and consultant. Um, he's published comics and graphic media. Um, he's been a community activist here in, in, Ro in uh, Dorchester and Roxbury for years. He has a BFA and a master's in the science of art education from the Mass College of Art. And he's currently a, uh, a f member of the visual arts faculty at Boston Arts Academy. Darrington. So today we want to talk a little bit about what it means to be an independent cartoonist, sort of really at that street level where you're either working with small publishers or self-publishing, um, and quite often dealing really directly with your fans and with the comic stores that carry the books that you create. Um, so it's sort of a cliche, you always sort of start these panels by asking, what brought you into comics? Um, but what I want to really talk about is sort of that journey from falling in like or love with comics to being inspired to put pen or pencil to paper and create art, and that shows how old I am, or picking up a computer and creating art, um, to then taking that next step to actually publishing your comics and sharing them with the outside world. And then in the case of the two individuals sitting up here as an editor, publisher, educator, trying to inspire and help other people do the same. So, um, Whit, would you like to start off by talking a little bit about your background and what brought you into the world of comics? Sure, hi everyone. And thanks to Northeastern for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so, I, I, I guess I first started getting into comics when I was in around second grade. Um, I hated reading and my mom thought that maybe getting me into comics would be a way to ease me into it. So she took me to the comic book shop, and I just kind of fell in love. Um, also, like Marjorie mentioned, I used to watch the X-Men cartoons um, on Saturday mornings, and that got me into comics even more. So I just started reading Archie. I was really into Archie um, and just doodling. I always loved storytelling, drawing, but never really took it very seriously. I went to college, did not major in art. I, was, I went to Brown. I was an anthropology major, which is, you know, not the most useful major, but whatever. Um, and then continued just drawing, doodling, started kind of self-publishing and teaching myself by going on the internet and looking up how to make zines. 
Um, then I moved to California and was kind of homesick because I'm you know, from the East Coast and was writing stories about my friends and my life. Um, and then I found out that there were small press shows and I, I went to this show in San Francisco called Ape and I was like, I didn't know people could do this, like that they could, you know, sell stories about things other than superheroes. It like blew my mind. So the next year I, like, I got my first table and that was like 2007, 2008 um, and just started going to as many shows as I was able to do. Um, kept self-publishing, getting to know folks, started writing about comics. Um, and then by the time I moved to Boston, I moved to Boston in 2010, I believe. Um, I went to grad school for public health. That's like my other life is I'm a health educator in Harlem. But like um, I was in Boston for four years, got to know like the local scene, um, started to know people from Boston Comics Roundtable. I met Dan Mazur, who's selling comics in the back. He was the first person that ever published one of my comics in one of his anthologies. And you know, now we're, we've worked together and stuff. So it's just kind of steadily grown over the years. And I've existed in a different field in my like, day job. But the rest of my life has really been devoted to comics. And Barrington. Barrington? <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> oh, how about you? How did, how did your journey begin? Uh, so, so like many people, I, well, first I'm from down the street, from around the block, Dorchester, and my mom worked at um, back what was called Boston City Hospital, um, or Bo no, Boston University Hospital, which is now Boston Medical Center, and she worked late nights, and she would always, often, you know, bring me to work um, with her because there was no childcare. Um, and of course, what she did with a young precocious kid like me who was a little obstinate, but loved to read and doodle and draw like many of us came up doing, she would give me stacks of comics and say, here, sit and read these. So I fell in love with things like, you know, Ben Grimm and Tarzan and Conan and the, um, that's where it started. Um, I realized in school I was always drawing and I became known as, oh, he's the artist, as if there was one, um, but he's that guy. So I started to take that identity on um, in middle school and high school. And around high school, when everyone else is, I went to school around the corner in the same building that I teach in, ironically. I'm tired of irony. <laughs> um, but in high school, I started to think about, like many people, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? Um, it's time to get serious. I was a horrible student. Um, but I had really great SAT scores at the time, and none of my peers could figure it out. And they go, you don't even read, don't even do, I'm like, I read all the time. No, you don't. I'm like, I, I do. But um, I was still the artist. Uh, I decided that I'm going to be an artist. I'm going to either animate or illustrate, either work for Disney, or I'm going to work, work for Marvel. And many, many people in my life, um, my, my background is my family's from Jamaica. Um, and that's just not something that anyone knew anything about. It's not something that anybody had any context. No one could give me any direction around that. Um, and, you know, we weren't, you know, we're working class, very, very working class, um, are, you know, read poor. Uh, and that wasn't seen as an occupation that you could do. So by the time I graduated high school, I decided to go to um, an HBCU, went to um, Hampton University to study marketing. And that was the worst decision I could have made at the time because I sat there for a year and just watched TV commercials and decided, yeah, this sucks, and didn't do that. But I came back to Mass College of Art to, because people said, wow, you're doing a lot of, you know, a lot of art. I'm like, yeah, you're not calling home for, you know, for allowance. No, nah, I'm hustling. And I was, I taught myself how to paint. I taught myself how to, um, you know, a lot of design skills and people started to see the potential of um, me making art. And yeah, that's how it started. I decided to come back and apply to Mass College of Art um, as an, an illustration. And even then, even in this process, there was still this kind of push-pull about whether you can be an artist, uh, whether it's sustainable, it's not. Eventually, what happened is someone said, you know, you should probably get a, you should probably take another major. You should probably study education because you know, you're a black man and they need black male teachers. Uh, and you're really didactic, I talk a lot, <laughs> you know. Um, and so I, I decided that in my life, in my, in my um, plan, 
education actually made sense because a lot of the content that I was starting to brew in my work um, was kind of had a, a paradigm shifting element to it, or I wanted to shift paradigms. And I figured learning about education was a good reason to get that master's. And of course, getting that master's meant um, opportunities. So I got tricked and eventually ended up, <laughs> I got sucked into being a teacher. And here I am 20 years later, still a teacher. Um, so I'm just now starting to, but I've always been making art, deciding to try to make art on the um, weekends or summertime. And I do comics as much as I sketch. I draw and draw incessantly. Um, and I'm just starting to kind of work into the, find myself into the world of um, publishing. Um, and realizing that this is something that's never going to go away, something that I really love doing, and I might as well get these stories out, get these narratives, and kind of counteract some of the uh, things that are primary vexations for me. So that's been the journey so far to here, to this point. So I really envy the two of you, because I, I fell in love with comics when I was a small kid. Um, started going to the barber shop with my dad, and we would pick up, I think, Richie Rich and Donald Duck and Uncle Scrooge. And, and then later on, I, I sort of graduated and started reading superhero comics, or in my mind, graduated at that point. Um, but I have no artistic ability. Just absolutely terrible. I, I played Pictionary with a group of people once. And at the end of the evening, I went out to the car, realized I'd left something behind. And when I went back in, the entire family was sitting around going through my drawings, rolling on the floor laughing, just completely mocking them, which included a minister. Uh, Shame, so attack. For you guys, the, the, that step, that sort of courageous step of starting to draw, starting to make stories, and then sharing those stories with the outside world, what was that like? Um, so yeah, I mean, I've, it's always been something I've been doing, um, and in my family, like, I came from a family with, like, a father who works in mental health, a mother who is a social worker, like, my family's teachers, like, art was never something that was considered viable in my family, so, like, when I went to college, it was, like, I didn't really have the option of going to art school, it was just, like, go do something where you can, like, have a stable career, and, like, I loved art, but, like, I never knew that I could it could be something where I could actually have a, like, it could be a professional thing. So, like, a lot of my life was just that struggle to kind of teach myself, like, technical skills while, like, holding down a job or doing something else, um, taking community college classes at night, things like that. So I think that's totally possible. I think that even for people who haven't gone to art school, there's ways that you can get better at art or you can kind of go after what you're looking for. And... Um, I've never been confident as an artist. Like, I feel confident as a storyteller. I love telling stories. That's what drives me in comics. Um, but I'm a very simple drawer. My lines are pretty simple. Um, and I feel okay with that. That took me a long time to really refine what I was going for. Um, so, I don't know. I kind of let the stories and the subject matters really um, dictate what I'm doing. I've recently been playing around with not using panels. Um, I've been using a lot of markers recently, like kind of childish things that kind of, I think, go along with my, my simple drawing style. Um, and I think that, you know, becoming confident as a visual artist is always going to be a journey and something that you're refining and growing with, hopefully. And I don't think I'm going to, like, five years from now, be necessarily drawing in the same style that I am right now. And I... I guess my orientation to storytelling um, comes from the fact that I'm naturally um, didactic and a little gregarious. Um, I have a big I come from a big family, so lots of younger brothers and nephews and couple nieces, but large extended families. And I've come always kind of been in the middle, of being a mediator. So communication's always been really important to me, and that's you know why I guess I also gravitated towards teaching. But I've never really been afraid to show work. I think um, I'm also, you know, child of the '70s, '80s, and urban areas. So hip hop is kind of like part, a large part of my orientation. Um, the graffiti culture, like just that, for better or worse, that swagger and braggadocio of never really being afraid, um, saying what you're gonna do, 
going, squirreling away, practicing, and coming back and doing it was always part of um, my orientation that pushed me to refine my craft and my skills. And um, so I do a lot of public art. I do big work. And I just got really comfortable failing in front of people and um, laughing it off. Um, so I think that translates to my work now. So sometimes it's a little um, catch as catch can. Um, I don't get nailed out to one media. But I think um, the humility of owning my failure helps me to um, have the courage to share my stories, but I think the main thing is that the, I feel the stories are important. Um, the things that I that happen in my head that keep pressing me, either I'm gonna dream about it for weeks or I'm gonna draw it. So I'll just get them out and keep stacks of books. Yeah, to jump on that, I feel like for me, a lot of my stories are about, you know, they're autobiographical, semi-autobiographical. So I've really drawn on just like my life experiences through like various jobs I've worked, different places I've lived. Um, and so that's always kind of the thing that um, is really big for me. And recently I've been doing more nonfiction work. So I'm starting to branch out into comics journalism, nonfiction comics, which I think is a really cool genre that has a lot of potential for storytelling. Yeah, and I have to say on my side of the counter, I've tried to be really cognizant of the fact that when people are bringing in comics, particularly self-made comics, mini comics, what a big part of themselves they're putting out there to share with you. Um, I actually don't think we ever reject anything. Um, I think we try to be pretty honest in like saying how we feel and it, you know, some things really, really touch us and strike us. But I think we're, we're pretty cognizant of the fact that you know it, it really is a, a risk for a lot of people. Um, and that you don't want to crush people because I, I definitely have seen, like, first of all, wit, wit stuff is just amazing. I, I love that, that simple art style you have. The stories are very heartfelt. Um, but I've seen people who started off pretty rudimentary and became, over a period of time, really, really fine storytellers. Um, and we need more fine storytellers, particularly telling diverse tales. Um, so how important is to, to you the, the kind of work that you do, the content of your work? What are you really trying to get out there? Um, I think if I look back at like everything I've made, there's definitely certain themes and things that I, I keep coming back to. Um, I think the biggest one is identity. Um, and kind of a lot of it has been like a therapeutic thing almost to like look back at different parts of my life and try to work through like what was going on, like how did I deal with it at the time, like what did I get out of it. Um, so like for instance I wrote a series called Mad Town High about my time in high school um, and I grew up in the suburbs in New Jersey, it was not diverse at all, I was like one of a handful of black kids. It was a very conservative town, like there was, there was racism, I was discriminated against, like my family, my, both my parents identify as black, but they're both mixed, so I didn't really fall into a, a box of being biracial either. Um, and so a lot of that series was just like, how did I deal with dating? How did I deal with making friends? How did I deal with teachers who were racist? Like, how did I, like, how did I, what did I do to cope with feeling lonely or like feeling isolated? Um, and I think that that's continued, like with the anthropologist, it was about going to Australia and like race relations there and comparing it to the United States. Um, even Boxes was about a temp job I did where I was literally like filing medical records with another girl who was Jamaican and we we're talking about race relations um, and it was like a little box of a room. So there was like multiple layers of like being separated into boxes, like what, what do you check off on the census, and like all these things that we were discussing. So I feel like that's a big factor in my stories. I think gender plays in, just like basic human relationship stuff, the minutia of life. Um, and also just, I would say, um, emotional stuff, emotional well-being, mental health, things like that. And um, the content of my work is um, often really sporadic. It, it's, I think the, it's not as it's not as personal, or I don't, or I don't think it's as personal because it tends to be um, a little bit more world building or more meta, thinking about um, social justice issues or issues in the world. Um, the, a lot of the recent things I've been doing, the larger story that I've been working on recently is um, about giants in a near future East Coast 
town with a young boy who rediscovers hip hop. Um, but that story is really about um, marginalization of um, certain groups and how do we make room for people who don't fit into our society. Um, you know, other stories have been about um, the irony of race. The, the, the other book that's back there on the table is about, um, yeah, what like just flipping the um, flipping racial dynamics. Like, what if if um, it's a popular belief among many black people that black people are the um, first uh, were the first people. And there's like how well how how contentious is that, and how do you convey that um you know that idea? So if you're the first at this, you have, kind of have to be the first at everything. Like you know maybe you're also the first sociopaths. So causing trouble and stirring things up with um, people who don't necessarily like to be jostled is probably the best way to describe the content, the overarching content of the work that I do. But it could be work about my class. I did a book called Loserville because one of my kids was being emo. I said, I'm going to make a comic all about you. <laughs> Can I add one more thing? Sure. Um, I just forgot to mention that I, I started doing, like I, I mentioned, the nonfiction work. Um, I did some work for the Nib back at, earlier in 2015. And um, the Nib is like a website that was off of Medium. And it was all for like comic, like different types of comic work. So comics, essays, nonfiction, um, journalism, some personal stuff, a variety of things. And I had known one of the editors just from like the small press comic scene and she started working there and they contacted me for International Women's Day to do a piece and I did it on black women and mental health and, and health disparities. Um, and then so like later I got contacted in the summer because Matt Bors, who's the editor, he's um, a comics journalist. He does a lot of political cartooning. Um, he wanted to get a group together of artists of color called The Response to write about different racial issues as they came up. Um, and so there are some really great people, including you know Chris Kindred, Richie Pope, and a lot of these artists who are emerging, especially out of the South, Richmond, Virginia, who are doing some really amazing work right now. Um, and that was really interesting, because especially, for instance, what happened in Charleston, a lot of these like events of racial discrimination that were happening throughout the year, I felt like sometimes we had to respond to these things or we had to comment. And sometimes I'm just, I was just like, I don't want to comment. Like, I'm burnt out on this. Like, I cannot, I don't feel, like, prepared to, to do anything about it. But other times it was really, like, energizing. Like, I did a piece on um, cultural appropriation that came out, I think, sometime in the summer. And that was fun, just to see the responses that people would write in, the debates that people would have. And I think that's kind of the beauty, too, of, like, comics on the internet is people having these discussions about things. Yeah, I'm, I mean, creating comics quite often can be a very solitary thing. Yeah. It's like you alone in front of a computer or at the drawing table. Uh, how important is community, building community, either in person or online to you and in, in, in motivating you to do work? Because um, I know as a retailer, the, the times... Boston has always had a lot of comic book creators, but it seems to me it's at its best when there's a vibrant community of people creating comics, sort of sharing experiences and, and spurring one another on. For you guys, how important is community and what kinds of communities do you try to build? So um, it has been incredibly motivating for me to be a part of the Boston Comics Roundtable, and I don't often, I don't always get to go but if you are ever, if you're interested, it's a really great group, and that community has been really important to um, motivate and um, help frame things. Because I can be in my studio, um, in my head, completely in the work, and I have no idea if it sucks or not. <laughs> you know, I have no idea if this font is legible, and um, just having that support, but also that validation that yes, you're not the only person. There are lots of people um, doing this crazy thing, and yeah, maybe you're not going to sell. 10,000 copies, but people dig what you do. Um, it's been really um, important. Um, and I, because I went to art school and the studio um, was really this generative place for me and having studio mates to um, give on the spot critiques and um, push you in, argue with you and challenge you um, was how I you know, feel like I got to a certain point. But then when that disappears, how do you get that that community, that artistic or that intellectual community, um, besides my kids, of course, um, uh, and and they can be really great too. But the idea of community that helps you 
challenge your ideas, challenge your aesthetic, challenge um, your habits and your process is really, really um, important. And I'm blessed to have many artistic communities. Yeah, I'd say in terms of artistic communities, the biggest two would be uh, online and then at shows. Um, and also, like when I was in Boston, I felt like there was a really great group of cartoonists that I was able to see semi regularly. Um, and I'm, I, since I moved back to the New York area, it's you know it's starting to build. But of course, I think it takes time to really get ingrained in wherever you are. Um, Online, like of course, there's like Twitter and Facebook and Tumblr and all that stuff. And like I've I've actually started to back off a little bit recently just because it's a lot and to like stay balanced, it's kind of like I have to figure out what I can handle. Um, I really like going to shows because I like talking to people, seeing people. Um, and I think there's really great people in the small press indie comics communities. And I wouldn't say it's just a community. I think there's a lot of it's starting to get bigger and explode. And there's a lot of little like groups within that. I'm not gonna say it's perfect because at times I can definitely feel isolated there. I can definitely feel snubbed. Like I feel like most people feel like that at some point. But um, overall, I would say those are the two places where I really am able to connect with other cartoonists and artists. Yeah, I, I think right now is a really exciting time in Boston uh, for comics community. Um, I remember back in the 90s, there was a very thriving comic community as well. But it was sort of on two tiers. There was uh, sort of an indie crowd who uh, published a lot of great work, self-published a lot of great work, but it was almost universally Caucasian. And then at the same time, there was a thriving community of African-American cartoonists, but most of them were very, target, very targeted on, on working for Marvel or one of the established companies. And I feel like the Boston Comics Roundtable, which has sort of developed over the last seven, eight years, is much more diverse, much broader. Um, we do uh, an educational uh, program at the Cambridge Public Library every year. And the first year we did it, um, we got this incredibly diverse group of kids. And it was an overflow crowd. They had to bring more tables in, more chairs. But the group of cartoonists that we got was one woman, and everyone was white. And so we really made an effort the next year because of to, to really seek out a lot of diversity. And the round table had that diversity to offer. So that the group of cartoonists I brought, and both years they were excellent with the kids, but the group of cartoonists that came the second year looked a lot more like the group of kids they were working with. And I think that's really important. It's one of the reasons I've always, I, not just African American comic art and African American characters, but Latino, Asian, women, transgender, bi, gay, lesbian. Um, I want my store to carry more and more a world of comics that represents the actual world around us. Um, and I think there's a great strength in diversity. Um, and I think one of the, the great things of our culture is when you really see all those different groups of, of people and cultures and attitudes meeting one another and forming even stronger, like developments in culture. Um, and and I, I'm really happy to see a lot of independent cartoonists bringing different voices from the voices that we've traditionally heard the last 20 or 30 years. Because, you know, I'm a, I started off as a mainstream comic fan. I love things like Thor, uh, Spider-Man, Conan the Barbarian. Um, but it's better to me nowadays to see both in mainstream comics and independent comics, more people who look like me, more people who come from backgrounds that I can relate to. Um, how do you see the work you do sort of broadening and reaching you know, an audience and sort of inspiring more people? Particularly since you're an educator, are you attempting to get your students into creating comics and, and sort of walking them through the steps they need to to get those comics out in the world? Yes. Uh, it's um, so I made a snarky remark about my life as an educator and um, it, it's snarky because teaching is really hard and teaching art is a teaching art the way I have the privilege to teach art in a school which is the you know the Boston Arts Academy is a school for visual and performing artists um, students where students audition in the um, ninth grade to get in and they are they stay in one major 
for four years. So it's really intense. They get really intense art training from us, and I'm really mean to them. My colleague, Natrice, will tell you the truth, that they, they, they shake when they see me coming. Um, but they are amazing, and they have such vivid imaginations. And, and I, I want nothing more but for my young students, and many of them, Many of the students I have that are so that are that are most skillful are the young women of color. I have so many young women of color um, that are just incredibly skillful, incredibly adept at kind of going up one side of a complex story and down, or processing something from popular culture into their own voice, and getting them to realize: yes, you can take this form and you can package it. You can finish a product. You can. Get, bring your voice to a larger audience is really, really important for me um, because many of them are stuck in this mode of um, creating fan art and just redoing um, things that are out there um, on the, you know, in the world of popular culture. But, uh, but at the same time, I hear their stories and I see their life and I know the, um, that there's a rich soil to kind of cultivate um, where the, that their stories will grow out of. So. At the last Mice um, Expo, I was really, really happy and, and fortunate to bring three of my students, um, one current student and two alumni who showed up and they table. They had a little tiny table by the door, right, Dan? And they were so excited to see that, yeah, their little comic, which was awesome, incredible, like ridiculous, just the black and white, I'm geeking out, but the black and white work from Katera's book was better than a lot of mainstream things I've seen. And that was just her kind of mid-level work. People loved their work and it transformed her life. It transformed um, how they saw themselves and what they thought they could do in the world. And this is the experience that I want for them. But beyond that, I want them to, and I'm trying to do it myself because you asked about the audience also. I really feel like the, uh, the lion's share of the work that we have to do is to expand the audience and kind of take advantage of some of this zeitgeist that's um, happening now. and bridge audiences because I can make comics about marginalized youth and people forever but if the people who really need to see these stories um, aren't engaging because of the cost or because of the stigma or whatever um, then it it feels it feels difficult and Renee will remember me doing stuff like this with his peers back almost 10 years ago but trying to get them to engage and get their stories out of their head is really important but also trying to get um, the audience to engage in, um, in comics and sequential art is equally as important. So that's a lot of the work I'm doing, trying to do now. Um, I, I agree. I mean, I think it's another golden age for comics, especially indie comics. I've never seen such a wealth of talent right now, especially from women creators, creators of color, people from all parts of the world who speak all sorts of, all sorts of languages people who are gay, lesbian, trans, like there's so much stuff, especially existing on the internet right now and on, in small press, that is amazing. But the problem is there are barriers. It can be out there, but if nobody's seeing it, that's a big difference. So I think that you know it's hard sometimes to go from that step of self-publishing to being published. And I think a bigger issue is distribution. I think our distribution system is very broken in comics. So we have Diamond, which is the main distributor of mainstream comics. And this guy, the guy who owns it, is on Facebook last week talking about how people are poor because they don't work hard enough. I mean, that's the attitude of somebody who's running the number one distributor in the world. So if you have people who have these barriers to entry for small press folks, like, what do you expect to happen? Like, people are fighting to have their work in bookstores, fighting to have their work in, like, comic book stores. And, in terms of the indie stuff, there are smaller distributors, some of whom I work with, who are fantastic and they're really passionate about what they do, but again, their reach is limited as well. So there can be wonderful work out there, but if people are putting it out and not getting paid, they're not getting distributed, it's not always a sustainable endeavor. And that's the thing that I think we really have to work on is supporting artists and writers and people in the industry and being able to actually make a living off of doing the work, not to mention page rates and things like that. So. Um, again, like I'm super excited about it, and I think it's great that there's more comic book schools, that there's people actually studying it and actually regarding it as an art form because it is an art form that is not like any other. And I'm glad that you know it's it, you're, we're seeing it more on television and the media, in the press, and all this stuff. That the internet internet is exploding with it. But again, for a lot of the people, even people who you think 
are well known, they're not necessarily making any money off of it. So that's just something that I think people need to know. Yeah, I, I have to say that it, because Diamond has such a monopoly, um, they could, one, be a great asset because they distribute stuff throughout North America, the UK, and Western Europe. And I think they even have, go into Mexico and parts of Latin America. But people need to push them. And part of the problem is that most comic book retailers are white, male, traditional comic fans. They love mainstream comics. And so I think as comic book readers, that you need to go online, you need to build audiences there, but then you need people to go into their local comic store, seek out the ones that sell the stuff that you like, but also go into the ones that don't and say, you know, if you carried this, I would shop here. I mean, I remember years ago, we, um, there's a, a comic creator named Scott McCloud, who at the time was doing a book called Zot, and then he went on to do a seminal work, Understanding Comics. Now, Scott and his wife lived right up in Somerville, and he was a regular customer at the store. But I never saw his wife. And I was like, I, doesn't your wife like comics? He, said, he goes, she does. But you don't carry Larry Martyr's Tales from the Bean World. And she refuses to set foot in your store until you do. Mm. So the next week, I carried Larry Martyr's Tales from the Bean World. Um, and I think it's very important, because I, I see this all the time, and I hear from other good retailers that will go out to other parts of the country, and you'll go to a store in a college town, and they don't even have challenging mainstream comics, let alone alternative comics. And part of it is that I think people, rather than just saying, I'm going to write them off, go in and say, look, here are the things that I like to read, and if you start carrying them, I'll start shopping here. And when those retailers get motivated to order that stuff, then the distributors get motivated to carry that stuff. But right now, there's really a network of maybe 50 shops in the country who love independent stuff, and they're clustered in places like Boston and Brooklyn and San Francisco. Um, and we all have developed networks for getting that stuff, but that doesn't get Witt's work or Barrington's work into Diamond's catalog. Um, and even then, there, you know, there are levels of racism. Um, I've got a couple of black history books that uh, Joel did, The Talented Tenth and uh, Strange Fruit. And uh, his publisher also publishes books about colonial history, comic books. Diamond Comics carries all of those books about colonial history, but they've refused to carry the two books about black history. Um, that changes when retailers step up and say, if you don't do that, maybe I'm going to have to think about ordering stuff somewhere else. So anyway. Um, yeah, I think I'm excited, though, to see that. I feel like people are becoming um, almost activists within smaller circles about increasing representation. Not only, like, there's groups of women, even on Facebook, like cartoonists who discuss these issues regularly amongst themselves. There's people of color, women of color, who are talking about this and trying to fight for it. And I think that's a really big part of it, is realizing it's not just about your, getting your book out. It's about everybody, like, trying to change the system, which is going to, you know, take some time. So, Well, and something else, uh, Jamie was just telling me yesterday that... Uh, a young woman of color just opened her own comic book store in Philadelphia. So that's the other thing that's going to happen. More people of color, more women, more members of the gay, lesbian, trans community are going to have to open their own shops um, and build a marketplace where people can come and discover great and interesting new work. So just a word about... I I'm, I, I really want to go back for a second and just say that I really, really do believe that, um, especially for me, some of the content that I that I really want to get out um, feels sometimes like I'm preaching to the choir. Or if if I do this and the audience is people who already love comics, and a lot of the things that I feel I want to challenge and and I want to. Um, present to the public have nothing to do with like people who normally consider themselves comic book fans and comic book um, readers. And I'm really that's that's I'm wondering like that's really sitting in in my head um, 
lately um, because I feel like I would love for the, the students, but also the, the friends I have on my Facebook <laughs> list, you know, to go into a comic book store and say, oh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not gonna just come here to see Barrington's work. I wanna see what else is going on. And to develop um, to that, that love for literacy. And many, not that, and my friends read lots of different things, but I feel like an expansion of the audience is really important. And I'm really hoping that some of the, the modern kind of current zeitgeist around this energy around geek culture, you know, can, it's, I'm starting to feel people coming out of the closet and like, I'm wondering, it, does that, do you see an increase of um, underrepresented people showing up in the stores? Well, I think, I think that something like Fun Home, you know, the autobiographical memoir of, of a lesbian woman could be a huge, huge hit and then turn into a Broadway show. Hmm. Um, that Persepolis, the you know, story of a woman growing up in Iran and the challenges she faced, um, both of those books were huge bestsellers. Um, and they brought tons of people into the store. I mean, that's the, the thing. I, I, I don't have, I have a shop in a, in, a, in a marvelous place. It's right in Harvard Square. There's a very literate crowd for it. Um, but I think store owners around the country would be surprised to know how many people are yearning to read good stories that aren't necessarily about capes, you know, and superhero deeds. And I think the people are out there. I mean, they go to the library. They, they check out tons of books about things that aren't fantasy, aren't adventure, or if they are, they're about fantasy and adventure in a way not normally portrayed. Um, I think the comic book store has too often been lazy in trying to, to bring those people in. And it's why, like, when I do my windows for the store, I, I don't put a lot of, like, Spider-Man or Superman comics in the window. We're a comic book store. People know we sell that. You know, I, I put Persepolis in the window. Mm -hmm. I put Mouse in the window. Mm -hmm. You know, I put Lumberjanes in the window. I try to put stuff in that says, we sell a bunch of stuff that you wouldn't normally think that we have. Um, so I, I, I think the audience is there. And like, like I said, you know, it, even something like Bone by Jeff Smith, which is not a comic book about diversity, but you would never have thought Bone was going to sell millions of copies. I mean, I met Jeff when he was self-publishing it initially in black and white. There was no thought that that was going to, you know, reach millions of kids. Um, so I think a lot of times, it, a lot of the major publishers understand this, which is why you see Pantheon and these people, random pals going into publishing graphic novels. What we have to do now is convince DC Comics and people like that to take the same sort of chances and have the same sort of vision that major publishers have. Do you see, um, I'm sorry, I'm, oh, I just realized I'm not the moderator. <laughs> oh, no, 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 go on, no, it, it's a conversation, it's, it's not. <laughs> do, do you see um, an, an effect of the model that Image has? Image Comics is definitely uh, different from Marvel, different from DC, different from, even, from, even from Dark Horse, because I, it's creator-based. Do you feel like that has anything to do with um, the current climate? Oh, I love, I love the Image model. Uh, Marjorie, who was sitting up here earlier talking about her book, Monstrous, which is a huge hit. I mean, that book is two issues in, and it's already the second or third best-selling comic book in the store. She sells double what Spider-Man sells. She sells 50% more wow. than Batman sells. Awesome. Um, and the only other book that outsells her is another image book. Um, and they have set up a system where the creators ha control the rights to the book and make many of the independent decisions, how many pages, what the price point's gonna be, what the schedule's going to be, and they get the lion's share of the money. Um, there's a guy, gentleman named Scott Snyder who writes Batman. It is the best-selling book at DC Comics, and he makes more money writing a horror book for Image. I see, John. No, what, no, what were you thinking? Witches. Right, he makes more money writing witches than he makes writing Batman. Um, and so, actually, what I've seen at the two major companies is just a mass exodus. I mean, 
Marvel just went through a thing where they restarted all their titles at number one. And I think the main reason was to sort of disguise the fact that half their really good writers left. Maybe two thirds or three quarters. They all went, they're all at Image writing stuff now. So Kelly Sue DeConnick, all these people are writing books that they could never write for Marvel Comics. And DC Comics is way behind Marvel uh, in terms of picking up on this. I've, people talked earlier about um, Thor, you know, certain characters like Thor being a woman now, Ms. Marvel being a young Pakistani girl. And by the way, I think this is great. Um, I think people there have said, you know, we don't have to be tied to these conventions and we don't have to be tied to them in the TV, you know, in the TV shows and the movies, but now we don't even really need to be tied to them in the, in the, the actual comic books. If we want a young Latino Spider-Man, we can do that. And I think that's fantastic. Me too. <laughs> I agree. Do you want to open it up to the audience for questions? I think that would be good. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? talking about like owner oh sorry you're talking about owners of stores and the diversity that is not present how would you say about educating because you said people can come to the retailers and say you're not selling this you're not selling this but how would you educate those store owners that lack diversity I guess in the comic book world because instead of keeping them separate you say oh these people can open up their own stores and come here and here but that still leaves a gap. How do you bridge the two? Um, or how would your suggestion about bridging the two, I guess? Well, I, I guess the, <clears throat> I own a store that tries to sell a lot of diverse stuff, so I love when people come to my store. <laughs> um, but I also uh, want to see the industry expand and thrive, because I think it helps all of us. Um, so what I'm saying is there are two things you can do, which is one, you can lobby your local comic book store to become a better store and to carry the things that you like. And if that doesn't happen, you can start your own store. Now, there are a lot of barriers to entry to starting a small business. It isn't necessarily a great climate to do it. But I think if you're in a city like Philadelphia or Los Angeles or whatever, and there isn't a store that meets your needs in a major city like that, I think there's space to create one. Um, Boston has some excellent stores, uh, Hub Comics, uh, Comicopia in Boston. There's some good stores that carry a lot of interesting stuff. But even still with the good stores, I think you need to come in sometimes and go, hey, you need more mini comics. Hey, there's this really great independent comic I've heard about. Can you get it? Um, and sometimes individually, but if you've got a group of friends who are also into comics, when five or six or seven people walk in at different times and start asking for the same thing, you reach for your, the phone and you start ordering those things. Um, and like I said, I, I don't think of myself as being the most knowledgeable comic book owner in the country. I don't think of myself as being the greatest taste maker in the country. But what I think is I've got a really great clientele and free communication with them. And I just listen, you know, and a lot of, you know, I will push certain things that I really support. Like we pushed Marjorie's Monstrous because we love Marjorie and because the book is amazing. Um, but at the same time, a lot of times my customers come and suggest things and I try them out and it turns out they're dead on. It also, I mean, you're also involved with MICE, which is the Independent Comics Expo in Boston. I think it's good, too, for local owners to get involved with, like, festivals or, like, community things as well. Um, and aside from s stores, I think it's also worth noting that in some areas, like rural areas, there might not be as much access to comics. And I have heard, too, that that's sometimes where places like Comixology or digital sales can actually fill a gap because people might not be able to pick something up at the store, but they can at least be able to get it online. I, thank you. I was just going to um, add that. I think um, you asked about how you push those stores, and I think you almost don't need to push, From if I'm not mistaken, the comics industry took a big hit in p recent years because of um, online comics and, on, well, not online comics, but just everything being online. And print media, print media in general, 
you know, people are saying this, you know, they're looking at the swan song. Um, so I think if you're really cognizant of where things are going, you're going to realize that, yeah, people, there's a diverse audience. Um, you have to kind of change your business model. So I think some of that is happening um, and more will happen. And I think that print and digital are going to exist together. I don't think like print's going to go away. I mean, if you go to like even a Barnes and Noble, you'll see that they have all the classic books with the new pretty covers that they're redoing. Like that's a market, you know, people are buying comics in print. They're buying beautiful graphic novels. They're buying minis. So I don't think that's something that's going to go away. Yeah. And I think if you, you live in an area that has shops, um, it becomes a cultural experience just going to a store, talking with like-minded people, meeting and bonding with people over the things that you love. So, I, of course, I own a brick-and-mortar store. I'm a paper fetishist. I want people to buy physical comics. Um, but, you, but, you know, they're both right in the sense that um, the online world is giving people much greater access to comics. Um, it's just that... I'm, I'm trying to think, how broad is the selection of books on comicology, comicsology or what? You can submit for like indie comics self-published. Um, I don't really know the process for that. So that's, but I don't know again, like how hard it is to find those selections on comicsology. but I know there's a lot of like the mainstream um, work on there. And I get most of my current information from my digital natives who come and say, wait, don't you know about Webtoons? Don't, you know, they have, there are these sites popping up all the time that um, young people, um, specifically young people, know so much more about because they're creating content that's um, for them, that's from their world. Um, so I think there, there's lots and there's so much, there's so much out there and besides comicsology and um, I remember, was it Zuda, Zuda.com that I used to love the work from Zuda, but then and Gum Road is a new one where um, people can, you know, upload whatever their um, indie self-published work is and sell it that way. So there's a lot of new things coming around. Back there. Let me give you that mic. Hi, Doc. Hi. Hi there. Hi, you guys. Um, <laughs> um, my name's Haida. I'm a member of the Boston Comics Roundtable. And I would just like to say that Tony does an amazing amount of stuff for the independent comics community mm. in Boston. And Thank we are you, very, very grateful to everything that he does. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's very nice of you to say. And I also want to say to the Northeastern community, as educators and students, to think about course adoption for comics, because that's a great way to support independent comics and to incorporate a lot of the really interesting diverse diverse content and diverse topics that are being in, put into comics these days. So um, <clears throat> I just I just think that comics are so interesting right now that they should be included in literature courses and they should be included in media co courses. And not only that does that support it, it I think it's um, a great way to get students really engaged in, in what is really contemporary discussions of the culture. And maybe you could talk a little bit about course adoption, how that impacts the industry. Well, I will say, speaking to what you said, that we've been supplying um, graphic novels to courses at Harvard, MIT, um, the, uh, the, I'm trying to think, what is the, the adult educa Cambridge, uh, Cambridge Adult Education? Um, we actually had one customer who used a book I have on the table, Strong Female Protagonist, and I thought he was teaching a graphic novel course, and it turned out he was teaching a graduate level literature course at Harvard. Um, but he was open to, he's a big comic book fan, and his students loved the fact that he included a graphic novel. Um, so it is, it, it is a great way of introducing people who are readers and people who have young, thriving minds to the fact that graphic novels can be very powerful and very informative. Um, and not everyone is open to that. I, there, there was an infamous meeting between Joe Sacco, who does comic book journalism, about places like Occupied Palestine, um, Garajda. Um, he had a meeting with Noam Chomsky once that Joe had, had set up because Noam was one of his idols. And Chomsky completely dismissed the fact that he 
does such serious work in comic books? Why, why would you do comic books? Well, it's because comic books are a rather unique medium. The ability to synthesize information and tell a very, grapping, a very gripping story, um, even a nonfiction story, in 50 pages, 100 pages, 200 pages, it reaches a lot of people that a prose book might not reach. Um, and I think particularly when you're talking about dealing with adolescents, middle school kids, high school kids, I think graphic novels can be a great tool for, for, for education. Yeah, it's a great way to support even like, you know, indie artists, self-publishers. I had someone recently who reached out to me who had used my work for some dissertation she was writing at university. I've had some people say they've taught my work in their classes and somebody who just had her students order something for a class coming up this semester. And like, that's like the biggest like compliment ever. And it's a really great way to like support people's work, especially like I've mentioned before, when it might not be able, as accessible. Like, of course, like Tony is a great supporter of small press works, but it's not something that unless people see me at a show or they happen to be at one of these places in a large metropolitan area where they're going to have access to my work. So on a, on a high school level, we've taught, um, you mentioned Scott McCloud earlier. We had Scott McCloud at our school doing a master class for students um, years back. Um, and they had no idea who he was. And I was totally geeking out because this is the god of, this is the godfather of modern comics language. And we've been teaching, we've been using understanding comics as a textbook um, to teach visual language um, since, for at least 10 years now. Um, and not only to our visual arts students, but we teach it, we used to um, help teach art history. So many students, no matter what their art, um, are studying comics as a language and they're being exposed to comics as literature um, even in their summer reading um, listing catalogs we there are you know books like blankets that are that are listed and um, I think that they're starting to see that they're coming back from college and having they're telling us yeah oh we were talking about understanding comics in oh, Hampshire and I was you know blowing people away because yeah because I taught you well so I think that is, that's emerging, at least on our level, and we're trying to because we believe in the, in the um, power of visual storytelling and comics as a language. I think academics, the academic community is gonna continue to be a big driver of like incorporating comics into just being accepted as a form of literature, as a form of education, like as an educational tool. Because um, you know, still like when you tell people you're a cartoonist, sometimes you're like, oh, that's cute. Like they don't really like understand like what it is. Oh, you draw like superheroes, or they, that's the automatic assumption. Um, but there's a lot of really cool like hybrids. Like I went to the comics and medicine conference like two years ago, which is this international conference um, that happens every year where they bring in academics, the medical professionals, health professionals, and cartoonists and illustrators all to talk about how to use it um, to teach people like patient education, caregiver like stories, like all sorts of things. And like that's so, so exciting. Um, and that's just one of the of many conferences and things that are happening regularly around the world now. Yeah, we don't think about that that much, but like Will Eisner, who is one of the giants of comics going back to the 1930s, spent the better part of two decades illustrating manuals for the United States military because for many of their troop, many of their soldiers, a comic was a much easier way of learning how to do something than simply a printed manual with a few random illustrations. Um, the one other thing I would add is a, a good thing to do is to press your local library uh, to carry independent graphic novels to, you know, I'm, most libraries now have a thriving graphic novel section, but press them to carry some things that maybe they're not going to find at Baker and Taylor. Maybe they're not going to find from Diamond Comics. Um, and that may even require them to go to their local comic book store and ask a few questions. Um, because that's another place where a whole new generation of comic book readers and a much broader audience gets built. I'm going to keep us on schedule and say we have time for one more question. Well, while you're thinking of your question, I'm going to give a little PSA that um, Barrington will be leading a workshop with our partners at Northeastern Crossing, the red banners in the back, on Thursday, January 21st. And this is a comic-making workshop 
for high schoolers. So if you know any high schoolers, please direct them to the back table and they can participate in this. We're going to take a break for lunch. There is lunch in the back. I'll give you the last word, Tony. But um, <laughs> we're going to take a break for lunch so you can shop and talk to your neighbors. We're going to reconvene promptly at 1.30 because there are some classes that are coming. So please come back at 1.30. And Tony, I'd like to give you the last word and thank this panel. Well, I would like to, to thank Barrington and Witt for their time and their, their brilliance up here. You guys are. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> And I'd like to thank all of you for coming, and particularly the, the people at Northeastern, like Jamie, who have just made this such a wonderful experience. Um, really happy to have done this today. Thank you.